Buenos dias. Buenas tardes. Uh, bon dia. Boa tarde. Wherever you are joining us for from for today. Welcome to the panel E of the inaugural session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. I am Fernando Shalcita from the University of the from Ateneo de Manila University. And I will be your moderator for today's panel entitled Latin America Views the Quincentennial. We are currently live on almost 100 Facebook pages, primarily at the National Quincentennial Committee, Department of Foreign Affairs, and other foreign service posts, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, among others. Earlier today, we heard panel E of the inaugural session discuss how the Philippines is shaping the international discourse on the quincentennial of the first circumnavigation of the world. Dr. Paulo Pinto of the Universidad Nova de Lisboa gave us more context on the Portuguese views on Magellan's expedition, thanks to the um, various archival sources that he and his team has unearthed in the archives of Portugal. Dr. Vernon Tatanes of the Ateneo de Manila's University's Rizal Library showed us how our ancestors 100 years ago commemorated what they called the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Magellan. <clears throat> then Dr. Danilo Perona of the Partido State University discussed uh, his ar archival work on Magellan and the Armada de Moluco and how the perspectives upon it shifted from 1521 to the present day. Finally, Professor Xiao Chua of the De La Salle University gave us a Filipino historian's perspective on the 2021 quincentennial commemoration in the Philippines and the values uh, the these celebrations seek to highlight to us in the present. Our panel for today is composed of professional diplomats from the countries of Latin America. They will give us their country's perspective on the historic Magellan Alcana expedition of 1519-1522 and how the respective nations are commemorating the 500th anniversary of this achievement of human mankind. Our first speaker began his career when he joined the diplomatic service of the Federative Republic of Brazil in 1976. He finished his graduate studies from New York University and the Candido Mendes School of Law in Rio de Janeiro. As a diplomat, he served in the Brazilian embassies in Prague, Buenos Aires, and Asuncion. He has also served as Ambassador to Timor-Leste, Mozambique, and Myanmar. Please welcome His Excellency Antonio Jose Maria da Souza e Silva, Ambassador of the Federative Republic of Brazil to the Philippines. Distinguished authorities, fellow ambassadors, dear friends. First of all, I must thank the Department of Foreign Affairs and the National Historical Commission for this invitation to take part of the Philippine International Conference in this notable panel on how Latin America Distinguished views authorities, the Quinton Senate. Fellow ambassadors, dear friends. First of all, I must thank the Department of Foreign Affairs and the National Historical Commission for this invitation to take part of the Philippine International Conference in this notable panel on how Latin America views the quintessential. I deeply regret not being able to join you virtually today due to a scheduled travel to Brazil. In spite of that, I felt I could not allow myself to let this opportunity go without dedicating some words about the Brazilian perspective on such important event, one that brings Latin America and the Philippines close together. Thus, again, my appreciation to the organization of the conference for letting me pre-record these quite brief reflections which I would like to share them with you. I also want to express my gratitude to the Department of Tourism and the administration of this beautiful cultural complex where Casa Manila stands out 
as a highlight in Intramuros. Indeed, a magnificent setting for the subject that brings us all together here. I begin with, I must highlight, that Brazil and the Philippines commemorate this year 75 years of diplomatic relations, which means that Brazil was among the first countries to recognize the Filipino independence in 1946. This means that 2021 is indeed a very auspicious year for the Filipino people. A moment to take stock of your history, your achievements and your challenges. From the arrival of the Magellan's expedition five centuries back to the creation of the sovereign state 75 years ago. Because of the distance, and we are talking about uh, 20,000 kilometers, we may sometimes lose sight of the many commonalities that Brazil and the Philippines share from the cultural and historical standpoint. Our countries may well be geographically far apart, but we are deeply connected not only by our history, religious traditions, cultural manifestations, but also by our most cherished values. Aside from Brazil being the largest trading partner of the Philippines in South America, our country have always enjoyed excellent bilateral relations and common agendas in the international arena. Therefore, when I received the invitation to this conference, I could not help but wonder whether we could track some hints of the special relationship to a more remote past. The fifth century of the passage of Ferdinand Magellan's expedition to the Philippines archipelago is a great opportunity to develop a state-of-the-art narrative and shed some lights on our ancient connectivityness. As you know, the expedition led by the Portuguese veteran Ferdinand Magellan was financed by Emperor Charles V and aimed to find a new route C, route C to the Moluccas Islands, the coveted islands of spices, precisely in the region where the Papal Bulls line would dividing the world among Portuguese and Spanish crowns. Indeed, in 1492, Pope Alexander VI divided the world between the two most important Western empires at the time. The Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 consolidated these imperial ambitions. For Spanish, the route through the Pacific was therefore an imperative to bypass the Portuguese patrol on African coast and the Indian Ocean. And to that end, they hired the services of the Portuguese experienced navigator for the late displeasure and fury of King Manuel of Portugal. This is only to say that in the late 15th century, Portugal and Spain played a key role in shaping the so-called early globalization, which finally aggregated in permanent terms the Americas and Asia to the world map and to international trade by the seas. Furthermore, let me also be reminded that Brazil and the Philippines were part of the very same empire for 60 years. Our lands were under the same ruler from 1580 to 1640 during the period known as Iberian Union, starting with King Philip II of Spain. Thus, namely, Brazil and the Philippines were both two pearls of the Habsburg possessions where the sun would never set. Of course, Magellan is known to Brazil by its Portuguese original name, Fernão de Magalhães. And at this opportunity, I would like to underline his stop in Rio de Janeiro before embarking on the most difficult and dangerous part of his journey until reaching 
the archipelago that we now today call the Philippines. Precisely because it was a long and unprecedented journey, the South American stage of the circumnavigation of the planet was celebrated in Brazil two years ago. Brazilian scholars, the Navy, universities, and history faculties held several events about the passage of the fleet through Brazil, which took place in December 1519. Only 16 months later would Magellan's Armada reach the desired islands of the Philippines. In Magellan's crew, there was a Portuguese seaman called João Lopes de Carvalho, who had already been in Rio de Janeiro, who also could speak sub to Guarani, the language of the natives of the coast. And so, he recommended this beautiful place to be the first stop of the expedition in the Americas. He had an eight-year-old son in Brazil who embarked on the ship Concepcion. So, we can say that the circumnavigation also had on board a little Carioca, as we call today the natives of the city of Rio de Janeiro, in which I include myself. The fleet stayed a total of 13 days in Rio, and maybe, I dare to say, this could be later be remembered as some of the few idyllic days of the tremendously tough journey to Asia. The smooth relationship with the natives was so positive that some historians would describe the stay of the fleet in Rio as a moment of feasting and lovemaking. But I will not descend into details of the stay of Magellan's expedition in Brazilian lands, mainly because two notable Brazilian experts, professors Paulo Pereira and Paulo Naus, from the Fluminense Federal University have been invited to talk about this subject on November 29th. And I kindly invite you all to follow this most interesting panel under the title, The Stay of Magellan's Fleet in Rio de Janeiro, Mariners and Natives in Guanabara Bay. Back to our days, as I arrived in the Philippines in last year's December, I was lucky enough to witness in January 2021, the 100 days countdown to the culmination of the quintessential celebrations on April 27, in memory of the Battle of Mactan. Not very well known in Brazil, I learned that Mactan has a profound symbolic importance to the Philippines. It means today the resignification of its cultural pre-Hispanic heritage by celebrating the victory of the indigenous leader Lapu-Lapu against Spanish troops. This reminds me of a similar episode of the Brazilian pre-colonial history of when the Portuguese also faced fierce resistance from some indigenous groups in Brazil. The narrative of this national celebration rightfully rejects the misleading title of the fifth centenary of the discovery of Philippines, as it is an opportunity to underline and value the achievements of autochthonous ancestors of the archipelago before the arrival of the colonizers, a fundamental mark of Filipino unique identity and strength. In parallel, the Philippines also celebrate what it may be, the deepest legacy of the Spanish colonization, the Christian faith, strongly rooted in national identity. The Conference of Catholic Bishops, also held in April, in a special session in the city of Cebu, to remind us all of the 500 years of the profession of the Catholic faith in the Philippines. Indeed, let us not forget that Brazil, Mexico, and the Philippines are the three countries with the most numerous Catholic community in the world. A country with a special connection with the Latin world, as expressed by some of your traditions in your food, your habits, 
And despite the undeniable strong Asian traces, one cannot deny that the Filipinos' name and surnames will always make you the most familiar Asians to Brazil, to Latin Americans. Finally, and just before summing up, I would like to take this opportunity to remind you of the next year Brazil celebrates 200 years of its independence. Another great opportunity, along with this quintessential journey, to bring our peoples together through culture and history in meetings like this. I am looking forward to further opportunities to share these special occasions with you all. Brazil will keep following with great intent, attention and interest the manifestation of the strengths of the Filipino mark in history, with which we share the Iberian past, the values, and I must stress, our multicultural identity. Finally, allow me to commend the National Committee and the DFA for the impeccable preparation and organization of this extensive program, panel, discussions, and brilliant celebration. And a special thanks to Casa Manila for opening the doors to the Embassy of Brazil. Thank you very much. Mabuhay, Pilipinas. Chile in Shanghai, Madrid, and Houston. Please welcome His, Ambas His Excellency Claudio Rojas Rachel, Ambassador of Chile to the Philippines. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, good morning, uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be in this uh, opportunity to share some ideas. Um, I would like to express my gratefulness uh, and appreciation to the organizer, of course, to the commissions, and to our colleagues from DFA who has invited us to be part of this uh, conversatorium. Uh, my idea today uh, is uh, focusing in uh, in terms of uh, what it will be the Chilean way on the in centennial commemoration. Uh, in terms of the contest that we are going to do, and you see the slide, uh, we would like to do, to also to focus on Chile and the Philippines in the common heritage shared history. Uh, we, we will touch upon the, also the 75 years of friendships between our two countries and looking up to the futures, challenges and opportunities and then we will have a sort of a reflections on, on the presentation. But it goes without say, it's in line with uh, what it was uh, uh, made the point by our colleague from Brazil, uh, that we, we really take this opportunity and we honor this opportunity offered to us in terms of uh, contribute our vision in this very and unique uh, moment in history for the Philippines and regarding to the 500 year celebration of the circumnavigation of the planet by Hernando de Magallanes. In that context, uh, the first thing that I would like to highlight also is that uh, on the 24th of November, uh, a Chilean professor, an expert, uh, a PhD, Jaime Rosenblatt, he's going to uh, participate also in this series with something that is a very interesting approach and is uh, the reflection on the uniqueness uh, of what has been so significant in the endeavor of Magallanes and what is the Southeast Asia and Latin America. And in that sense, how uh, we are going to touch upon in that opportunity by Professor Rosenblatt the fact and the importance and the significance of uh, trade routes, all trade routes, and also uh, building upon the idea that was presented by my dear colleague from Brazil, that uh, the sense of globalization that is uh, in connections with uh, with what this was uh, this endeavor carried on by Magallanes and uh, his group. Uh, so. We will move on then, uh, and then uh, what is important for us is to uh, 
to identify the sense of identity that is associated uh, as a nation, and also the core idea what it is from the South American to Asia and Valparaiso in terms of what is been uh, uh, the essence and the cornerstone of our uh, presence in the Pacific Ocean, where Chile has a coastal line, as everyone knows, of more than 6,000 kilometers. So the Pacific and looking into the Pacific Ocean is our uh, sort of momento in the sense that is our life motive and therefore is unique. So let me say that from 1520 to 2020, the Strait of Magellans has forged the identity of Chile as a country past, present, and future on trade and the significance of trade routes, free navigation, and a door and a bridge to facilitate the movement of people, goods, and services through the history. It's been unique for Chile in terms that the Strait of Magellan and the sovereignty right that Chile exercised in that very important passage between the two oceans has been an instrument of international cooperation, building capacity, and share friendship with many other nations. In that context also, Chile has been instrumental to promote immigration and people from all walks of life and on different parts of the globe to come and to settle in that part of the southern part of Chile. So therefore, we, we are very trustfully that the commitment that we have done in terms of open up our route for free and open trade, to emphasize the fact of the main routes uh, be open, the use according to the law and free of navigation is a major importance and significance. And all of that, and this is what is most important, is due to the fact that because Magallanes, Fernando de Magallanes was able to discover the Strait of Magellan and the unify a crossing between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. Those that is very significant and it's a very sense of deep responsibility for Chile and of course for the rest of the countries in the area. Therefore, Valparaiso was a cornerstone through the colonial times and in nowadays too, has a, a very significant port. Probably my colleague from Mexico will talk about the Manila Galleon and its reflection that the connection with Acapulco also. Uh, and that's the sense of the significant what is what happens in the north part of the Americas, but in the southern parts of the America, Valparaiso, the Strait of Magallanes, and the port of Callao in Peru was very significant. Then it writes for itself the importance of the Strait of Magallanes, who only not helps Chile to build its economy and his uh, position as a country in the context of the South American and Latin American continent, but goes much more beyond that because it has helped us to foster our economy, to create our own identity as a country, and also to uh, promote links with people all around the world. So therefore, during 2020, at the level of the presidential initiative, it was established a commission, a high-level commission, that was responsible and look after a full year of different events that will commemorate this very unique moment. Due to the pandemic, of course, many of the activities were not really, um, in a sense, uh, they couldn't fully be uh, enjoyed by all the people. But what is important and what is more significant, though, is something that is very symbolic. And I would like to share that it was very symbolic in the sense that we replicate 
the passage of Magellan through the Strait of Magellans, and then we have that done by the uh, naval vessel that is uh, uh, the army from Spain, Sebastián Elcano, going through the Magellan Strait along with the Esmeralda, who is also the school vessel for the Chilean Navy. So that moment reflects the uniqueness of and the desire of people that they have attached their life into the Navy and to the life at the sea, where these two beautiful ships, they cross together, the Strait of Magellan. And that, it was very significant. But let me see one of the things that it was very important also. We have done uh, the work together with Argentina, Spain, and Portugal in doing these efforts and this celebration. And uh, this is a, also was attached in the sense of uh, the dimension of Catholicism. Because it's true with Magellan, Catholicism came to our shore. And what it was important that there is a race, a major cross, where it was the first time ever held a mass in the southern part of the continent, where it was the stop that they did the Magellan expedition and went to shore and they have a mass. And in that same spot, nowadays rise a beautiful, a very tremendous and impossible, I mean, very significant uh, cross to make that signification. And then the other idea that we commemorate on this uh, endeavor was the fact of having the encortent of three world. We are the view that as long as uh, we promote uh, a better understanding and knowledge base among countries, the encounter of the three worlds, what is signified in the case of the Magellan, is also a reflection of what is been for us. And I think that is a limestone by itself. So as you see, Chile, since the very high top authorities of the country, two different segments of its civilian society, and including the armed forces, we were all together in celebrating and commemorating Magellan. So now, how we we connect this, particularly with the case of the Philippines, and then the core ideas that I would like to highlight is the fact that the impact of the colonial period in our two countries. Uh, the Philippines, we are Latin cousin, so to say, in this part of the world. Uh, it's very, very true, and everyone knows that a Filipino with a guitar can make, you know, a party to go. The same goes in Latin America. The joy of food, the sense of friendships, the value of family, and the, the sense of camaraderie the, to enjoy friends. And also to rediscover our own history what brings us today to the present moment. And this is very important, at least in our perception, is to realize that between Philippines and Chile, but goes beyond Chile, between the Philippines and Latin America, there are only complementarities. And therefore, as nations that we complement each other, we can work easily together to foster a relationship. And what is the sense that we want to recover the sense of the historical perspective and the common heritage? Is that the sense of the use of the Spanish, the sense of the use of the Spanish language? And this is a very unique something that we have to reflect upon. Because the significance of the Spanish as a language that is widely spoke all around the world. But what is more significant that in the United Nations in 1948, 
there was a resolution passed to make the Spanish an official language of the United Nations. And this resolution, it was the initiative of the Philippines and got the support of all Latin American countries. So therefore, there's this sense of belonging, the sense of having a common root. And therefore, the challenge for us now is how we wider that baseline that we have in terms to move ahead. Also, it reflects that we share very much so the same character of our society. I was telling you about the sense of familyhood, the sense of Catholicism. Chile is a small country compared to Brazil and Mexico, but the Catholic faith is of one of the major ones, is the major one, so to say. So there's also that commonality, but in a positive sense, in terms that have created, through Catholicism, also a movement that supports the social progression and progress and well-being of people. So that's also part of the work that is always done by the Catholic Church in Chile in terms to attain those less fortunate and try to contribute for a better life for them. So in this sense, and with this occasion, we feel that we're in a position to talk and to open up new venues for discussion with our colleagues and our friends here in the Philippines. We are proudly and profoundly influenced by our Spanish culture in the sense of our language. We see Spain as an icon and as a reference in terms that we were able to uh, acknowledge its historical perspective and its tradition and the use of the language. We perceive now that the Philippines, in the dimension of our Latin cousin, we have the view that the Philippines should be in a better position to facilitate our connection and our integration with other countries in the region. And I think that that's a challenge that we have posed for. We are an old partner with the Philippines. We came here also in 1946. And we are also celebrating the 75 years anniversary that I will refer later on. But what is important is that since 1946 we came here, in the eve for the Philippines to become an independent country. And that's very symbolic. And I think that we have a combined Philippines all through this year in a positive manner where we are identifying new venues to be developed. Therefore, we are interested that as a result of this cultural engagement related with Hernando de Magallanes and his historical and fantastic uh, endeavor, that probably could open up the realization that is the time for the Philippines and Latin American countries to work together in terms of promoting a vast, more open assessment in terms uh, of cultural integration and knowledge base in both sides. And even though that we are far away, 20,000 kilometers far away, as was said by our colleague from Brazil, there's much to be done in the area of integration and people-to-people -people contact. So this movement that had started 500 years ago, nowadays with these functions and this celebration and what is you are doing, is really moving the agenda forward. And it coincides and it reflects upon the own interest that we are selling in Chile. So now, what we want to realize, the sense of this commitment that we have in the context of our long tradition with the Philippines. So we want to remember our relationship with the Filipina, our oldest partner in Southeast Asia, our oldest partner. 
The Chilean Embassy has been settled here since 1967, an open embassy, a resident permanent mission here. And then we see this opportunity has a renewed friendship with the common interest looking ahead. And therefore, there are challenges and opportunities. Uh, and where there is a challenge, there is an opportunity. And where there is an opportunity, there is a challenge. But in the sense that we, the people that we are entrusted to work on this and to promote and foster a relationship, we have to believe so and we have to try to move on. Uh, more than half a century, Chile has been here in the Philippines. It makes a mature relation. And when you have a mature relation, you're going to speak about everything. And then, of course, when you are mature relation, then you are able to move forward in a consistent manner. So what is the reflection with Magallion? That is a process that has never ended. It's always been continuous. Since 500 years ago, when we became, through the domain of Spain, together in the same empire. And now it's our responsibility, as an independent nation, how to move forward in the sense of what we want for our nation and for our future. And that brings me to the sense of looking to the future. And again, I reiterate what has been present all through my words uh, this evening in the sense that the, this celebration is an opportunity to have an assessment in both regions about our common history and to identify those elements that could really be fostered and promoted to a better level. But with a particular uh, concentration and effort in our levels of universities and academia, in the knowledge-based community, because the only way to maintain and to sustain this process is as long as we are able to understand each other. And to do so, we have to do it from knowledge base and to break apart those stereotypes and those things that are not really reflects properly in a manner between countries and people. Again, Philippines can be a unique partner for Chile and Latin American countries in the region. We believe that Philippines is, is in the most prestigious position to do so. It's a founding father and a founding nation of the ASEAN community. And now we see that ASEAN is playing a centrality in what is really going on in this region, in political, economic, trade, and geopolitical terms. So therefore, uh, we perceive that Philippines could help us to understand the process. And then, we are not in a position to wait more to come. We want to really grab it and move forward. Don't let those opportunities to fade away. I think that's, that's basically the need for us in the promotion of understanding our differences, but working on diversity in the sense that diversity is something of a qualification that is positive because it brings you about new ideas, new concepts, new formulation. So in closing, I think that uh, from the Chilean point of view, the anniversary of the 500 years of uh, the circumnavigation of, of Hernando de Magallanes is basically an icon in world history. It changed humanity, it changed the history of our world in that very simple element and in that very simple but dramatic uh, endeavor. Why it's so dramatic? Because it started with three ships, with a large crew, and in the process, when they came back, it was a very, just one ship and a very small crew. So they were willing to give their life in what they believe. 
and that reflects the commitment. As long as people have commitment, probably is the reflection that we are moving ahead. So that's one element. The other element, as was highlighted before, is the sense of globalization. But then what is more important in the sense for us is a sense of innovation, of belief to do things in a new way, to believe and to explore new horizons, to go forward in terms to realize your dreams, to be precisely responsible in what you are doing, in what you are committing, to find results, find outcomes that will honor your commitment and the work done, and therefore done by many others, by all the men, by all the persons that campaigned Magallans. And now, if you see the notes of an Italian uh, reporter that was in, the, in his crew, he was making this reflection that probably if you take into account that among the, the seamen that Agompai Magellan were people of all, of different nations. No, I wouldn't say all around the world, but different nations. And that created a sense of, of purpose, the sense of commonality, and the sense of work together. Then, the other thing that is unique and is fascinating in the sense that how we see in Chile is the uh, possibility to be put in the world map. Chile was put in the world map because the Strait of Magellan was found and discovered. Chile, a very small nation at the end of the South American continent, has had a tremendous significant importance in trade routes and our commitment to free trade and our commitment to uh, liberty of the sea and, and, and the promotion of uh, trade routes. Therefore, what is start 500 years with this uh, fantastic icon of world promotion of humanitarian, humanity promotion, it remains and still be uh, present nowadays and day by day in what we do and what we promote to do. So our invitation is to acknowledge the possibility for us to be tonight with you, but besides this, this knowledge, to invite you all, particularly our Filipino friends, to take on and carry on this challenge that we have. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. Maray pun salamat, Ambassador Rojas. Our third speaker is the current Chargé d'Affaires of the Embassy of the Republic of Argentina in the Philippines. Mr. Mauricio Herman Muñoz is the Embassy Secretary, that is the head of the Cultural, Commercial, and Consular Sections of the Argentine Embassy in the Philippines. Prior to this position, he served as desk officer for the Directorate for Asia and Oceania, responsible for the relations between Argentina, Indonesia, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, and Timor-Leste. He also served as a consultant of the Argentine Ministry of Culture. Currently, he's taking up his master's degree in economics and business with Asia Pacific at the National University of Tres de Febrero. He has a licentiate degree in international relations from the Catholic University of Argentina. Let us welcome uh, Mr. Herman. Good evening, Your Excellencies, Ambassador of Brazil, Antonio José Maria de Souza e Silva, Ambassador of Chile, Claudio Alberto Rojas Rachel, Ambassador of Mexico, Gerardo Lozano Arredondo, and Dr. Fernando Zialcita of the Philippine Academic Consortium of Latin American Studies. I would like to express my sincerest appreciation to the conveners of this panel, PACLAS and the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. It is, our, it is an honor for me to be here today representing the Argentine Republic. When in my university days, I became interested in the Philippines, motivated by the richness of its culture and languages, Little did I know that years later, I would be participating on this side of the world in an event of such historical relevance for Filipinos. 
Without further ado, I would like to point out that in my presentation, I will address three issues. Firstly, the passage of Magellan through present day Argentina. Secondly, the legacy of this expedition for my country. And finally, I would like to touch on the development of the bilateral relations between Argentina and the Philippines. So starting off with the first point of my presentation, what was the Argentine part in the first circumnavigation of the world? Historiography indicates that Ferdinand Magellan entered the Rio de la Plata in January 1520 in search of the interoceanic passage. When realizing that it was not a strait, he continued along the coast of South America, and two months later, he decided to spend the winter in the Gulf of San Julian in the Argentine Patagonia. The five ships of the expedition's fleet remained there for five months, although the decision to stay in the area met with strong opposition by a large part of the command of the ships and part of the crew. It is interesting to note that Magellan's crew participated in the first Catholic mass in Argentine territory on April 1st in 1520. The expedition spent two months in the Gulf before seeing native peoples for the first time. Magellan called these giants Patagones, so the region soon became to be known as Patagonia. Before continuing the exploration, Magellan sent the ship Santiago to reconnoiter the coast to the south with Juan Rodriguez Serrano as captain. On May the 3rd, 1520, they found the wide estuary of a river that they called Santa Cruz. The ship crashed and its crew had to set camp at the site until Magellan could rescue them. They would continue the journey on October 18. Three days after leaving, a hundred miles farther south, the fleet coasted along a sandy headland and entered a bay. Magellan sent the ships Concepcion and San Antonio to explore it, looking for the long-awaited way through to the west. After navigating for more than 100 miles without traces of fresh water, they realized that they had not reached a river mouth, but rather the Strait of the Great Southern Sea. The flotilla entered the pass between towering mountains, and to the south, the explorers saw many bonfires, and thus Magellan named the place Tierra del Fuego. This is in fact the name of the southernmost province of Argentina, Tierra del Fuego, Antarctica, and South Atlantic Islands. I would like to move now on to the second point of my presentation, the legacy of the Magellan expedition. For the Argentine Republic, the Magellan expedition has a special meaning as it is intrinsically associated with the legitimate and imprescriptible Argentine rights in the sovereignty dispute over the Malvinas, South Georgia, and South Sandwich Islands, and the corresponding maritime and insular spaces, an integral part of our national territory. The recovery of said territories and the full exercise of sovereignty, respecting the way of life of its inhabitants, and in accordance with the principles of international law, constitute a permanent and inalienable objective of the Argentine people. It should be remembered that the Malvinas were part of the area under the jurisdiction of Spain since the entry into force of the first international instruments that delimited the New World shortly after 1492. The Papal Bulls and the Treaty of Tordesillas of 1494 constitute the first instruments that received titles from Spain in accordance with the international law of the time. From the beginning of the 16th century and during most of it, only sailors in the service of Spain traveled the maritime routes along the South American coast, moving south in search of the interoceanic passage. In this advance, the discovery of the Malvinas Islands by members of the Magellan expedition took place in the year 1520, as well as the first Pacific map of the islands, made that year by the captain pilot Andres de San Martin. From that moment on, they were registered in the European cartography with different names, and they remained within the spaces under the effective control of the Spanish authorities. Once the independence process began, these islands discovered by Magellan were inherited by my country from Spain by succession of states, according to the UT Positatis Juris of 1810. So as you can observe, the Magellan expedition has a very special meaning for Argentina. To introduce the next and last point in my presentation, 
the bilateral relations between my country and the Philippines, I would like to quote Dr. Rene Escalante, the chairperson of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and concurrently the executive director of the National Quincentennial Committee. He said, very interestingly, focusing just on Magellan will complicate things as the Filipinos have been battered with centuries of cultural timidity due to Eurocentric narrative. But we cannot discount the fact that Magellan's vision to discover a route beyond the Americas contributed to the destiny and destination of humankind in the last 500 years, especially the Filipino people. Rephrasing this a little bit, I think we cannot discount the fact that Magellan's vision to discover a route beyond the Americas contributed to the fate of the Argentine-Philippine relations. This is indeed one of the oldest ties that my country has built in Asia, facilitated by our common Hispanic heritage. It is important to point out that the ties between Argentina and the Philippines predate the establishment of diplomatic relations in 1948. In fact, there are records of exchanges of goods and people-to-people -people links before that year. It is interesting to remember that the elder brother of liberator General San Martin, Juan Fermín de San Martin, lived in Manila, as did his descendants. Giving value to this connection between Argentina and the Philippines, in 1950, on the 100th anniversary of the death of our national hero, then President Juan Domingo Perón proposed placing a bust of San Martin in Manila, which is located today in near Intramuros. I believe that looking back at our history, is of the utmost importance to increase mutual knowledge, especially as Argentina and the Philippines approach their 75th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations in 2023. I think this is a propitious time to reflect on what we have done so far and what we can do in the future for the mutual benefit of our nations. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias at maraming salamat po. Muchas gracias, maraming salamat, Mr. Herman. Our final speaker for tonight is a career diplomat with the Foreign Service of the United Mexican States. He began his diplomatic career in 1981 and has served at the permanent mission of Mexico to the United Nations, the Mexican Embassy in France, and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Since 2017, he has represented Mexico as its, as its ambassador to the Philippines. He holds a doctorate and master's degree in national security from the Center of Naval Higher Studies and a bachelor's in economics from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Please welcome His Excellency Gerardo Lozano Arredondo, Ambassador of the United Mexican States to the Philippines. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome back, Gabby. Buenas tardes. Good evening to everyone. First of all, I would like to congratulate the government of the Philippines, and in particular, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Philippine Academic Consortium for Latin American Studies for organizing this event about the Latin American views on the quincentennial. I would like also acknowledge the invitation extended to the Embassy of Mexico in the Philippines to participate in this session and present the views of Mexico on the 500th anniversary. Now, if you allow me, I am going to accompany my intervention with a PowerPoint. This presentation is an invitation to recall the historical ties that exist between Mexico and the Philippines, a product of more than 450 years of relationship, which began during the colonial era and has left an indelible mark that is still visible to these days. In the same way, I will try to explain how and why the relationship between our countries 
was interrupted for more than a century after the independence of Mexico and how this period of time, although eroded, was not able to erase the cultural ties, ties and traditions that once united our people. Finally, I will briefly review Mexico-Philippine bilateral relations from a diplomatic standpoint and explain how it evolved to the present day. Let's begin by recalling that, as in the case of the Philippines, this year, Mexico also is commemorating important event, events, which, as can be seen later, has a transcendental impact on the historical development of both, uh, of both our nations and on their common destiny. In 1521, the fall of Mexico Tenochtitlan took place at the hands of the conqueror Hernán Cortés, and with this began the blending of two, of two cultures that will give rise to the birth of Mexico as a nation. This process was not achieved without pain. The same year, as has been said, eh, Fernando de Magella arrived at the shores of Easter Samar, together with San Juan Sebastián Elcano, after concluding the first circumnavigation trip. Magellan and Elcano claimed this land in favor of the Spanish crown, the Philippines, a name that was provided by the explorer Rui López de Villalobos in honor of Prince Felipe of Spain. At that time, there was no suspicion of the transcendental impact that both events would have on world geopolitics and how it would lead to transformations in the field of science, politics, economics, religion, and commerce, among among others. Subsequently, another <coughs> subsequently another two events almost simultaneous will unite the destinies of Mexico and the Philippines for two and a half centuries. On the one hand, the creation of the captaincy of the Philippines, and in the other, the discovery of Tornaviaje by Andrés de Urdaneta. The captaincy general of the, of the Philippines, founded in 1565, was a territorial district of, of the, Spain, the Spanish Empire in South Asia, administrated by the Viceroyalty of New Spain, now Mexico, for more than 250 years. In 1821, following the independence of Mexico, all control was transferred to Madrid. It is important to underline that during this period, some of the governors of the captaincy were Mexican Creole, as well as a friars who carried out the, the, evangelic, the evangelization. And most of the members of the army were recruited from the new Hispanic population. This gave rise to a kind of mestizage between Mexicans and Filipinos, not only in racial terms, but also, but especially cultural. This is reflected in different manifestations of Filipino life that, that prevail, prevail to this day, such as tradition, religion, language, and food, to name a few. The Spanish crown has to wait more than 40 years after Magellan III to find, in 1565, a return route from the Philippines to the Americas and make the desired return journey a reality. This achievement was due to Fray Andres de Urdaneta, who discovered the fast and warm waters of a Curishibo current, which departs from Southeast Asia and reached the coast of California. This major event allowed the establishment of the famous Galeon route between Acapulco and Manila, also known as the Manila Galeon. This route, considered the first example of globalization, became for 240 years a valuable instrument for the exchange of goods and people between Asia, America, and Europe. 
which left a deep mark on the cultural traditions on both sides of the Pacific. Thus, from American continent, the Philippines received, um, among other goods, corn, various types of chili, tomato, potato, chayote, sicama, sweet potato, avocado, maguey, tobacco, cacao beans, that is, in, in the, is the essence of chocolate, fruits like guava, pineapple, chico, sapote, and squash. From Asia through the Americas, uh, sorry, from Asia through the Philippines in the Manila Galeon, transferred to the Americas, rice, coconut, mango, and tamarind, all with an, with a, an additional element, the skills, enhanced of the Filipino crew of the Galeon to plant and harvest with rice and produce wine from the coconut palm, the tuba. Silver was another important merchandise that, that was transported by the Galeons. Usually, coins in silver coins of eight reals or pesos, which were the basis of the island trade with the, the entire Asian continent and the and the product that the Chinese traders demand and appreciate most. For this reason, the Galleon route was also known as the Silver Way. Likewise, the silver, mainly Mexican, was essential to, to finance the public finance of the captaincy, including the payment of salaries for civil servants and the army. In the same way, clothes and traditions were exchanged and are so deeply rooted in the daily life of both countries that in some times it is impossible to identify their origin. Examples of this transculturization are the guayabera and maron tagal, the textiles, the palapas, and the coco fight, among others. Religion was another element that traveled in the Galeon. During the colonial period, a strong process of evangelization took place in Mexico and the Philippines that converted the population of both territories to Catholicism, the dominant religion to this day. The devotion and images of Virgin of Guadalupe, the Black Nazareno, and the Santo Niño continuing traveling from both sides of the Pacific Ocean. The route that uh, one day allowed to commercialize, uh, to, to, the route that one day allowed to commercially unite three continents and left a deep mark on the culture of their people was interrupted due to the Mexican War of, of Independence. The libertarian thought that was uh, thriving in America became a treat to the interests of the Spanish crown in Spain. So the Galleon trade route completed its last trip in 1855. At this point, I would like to remember the life of Ramon Fabier, a young Filipino liberal thinker who completed his studies in Mexico City, City at the Colegio de Minería, and in September 1810, joined the independent movement headed by the founding father of Mexico, Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla. Fabier was appointed lieutenant colonel in infantry and participated in the fortification of the city of Guanajuato, directing the manufacturing of arms and ammunition. Unfortunately, months later, he was apprehended by the Royalist forces and executed. Nevertheless, some streets and squares in Mexico have the name of this Filipino hero. Various historical events and change played a role in the weakening and, to some extent, the disappearance of the close relation between Mexico and the Philippines that had lasted for more than two and a half centuries. On the one hand, the Mexican government has to focus its efforts on consolidation of its independence and preserving its territorial integrity in the face of external threats. For its part, the Philippines maintained its dependence on Spain for several years and late became dependent on the United States. 
which wanted to erase the traces of the Hispanic presence and therefore the presence of Mexico. To this, we must add that subsequent development of faster international trade routes, routes through the opening of the Canal del Suez and the construction of the Panama Canal, which made it possible to re replace the historic Galeón route. More than a century passed before Mexico and the Philippines could have a brief but, diplo uh, but emblematic rapprochement, thanks to the visit to Mexico of President Manuel Quezon in April 1937, during which he met with Mexican President Lázaro Cárdenas. Years later, in 1944, the Mexican Expeditionary Air Force, through the 200, <coughs> 201 Fighter Squadron, participated in the military operations to liberate Luzon Island during the Second World War. This operation was the first time that Mexican Air Forces entered into action of war outside of the national territory. The Squadron 201 was composed of 300 personnel, including 30 pilots that participated in close of 100 air combats in which six of them died. With the liberation and subsequent independence of the Philippines, a new era of bilateral relations between Mexico and the Philippines was born. In 1953, both countries signed an agreement to establish diplomatic relations. The same year, the representation of Mexico was opened in Manila, and in 1961, with the objective of strengthening the diplomatic relation that began eight years earlier, it was decided to open embassies in both capitals. In 1962, then Mexican President Adolfo López Mateos made the first state visit in which commercial, political, and cultural rapprochement and, it, <coughs> and interest between the two countries emerged. After the visit, in 1964, the year of Mexican-Filipino uh, friendship was decreed. This celebration coincided with the fourth anniversary of the memorable Tornaviaje under the command of Miguel López Legazpi and Andrés de Urdaneta. During this year, statues of national heroes were exchanged, such as the Miguel Hidalgo in Intramuros in Manila, and the monument of José Rizal in Paseo de la Reforma in Mexico City, as well as, as, well as artistic groups traveled between both nations. After, after that, also some other presidents visits took place. For example, in, in 1973, Mexican President Jose López Portillo visited the uh, Philippines. And in 1981, President Fernando Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos visited Mexico. In 1997, President Vicente, uh, Fidel Ramos visited Mexico, as well as President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, who visited Mexico in 2001 and 2002. The most recent visit is, the, is that of Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto, who paid the visit to the Philippines in November 2015 on the occasion on the APEC Economic Leaders Meeting held in Manila. During his visit, Peña Nieto and President Benigno eh, Aquino III discussed the strengthening of commercial relations and witnessed the signing of bilateral agreements on the global taxation, tourism cooperation, and the fight against drug trafficking. Throughout almost 70 years of diplomatic relations, Mexico and the Philippines has, have built an important legal framework to institutionalize the relations of friendship and cooperation, which include agreements in different sectors. In economic terms, Philippines, it is our fourth trainer in Southeast Asia, 
the eighth in the Asian Pacific region, and the 21st worldwide. In 2019, bilateral trade amounted to more than three, three billion of US dollars. Mexico is the most important, is the second most important market for the Philippines in the Americas. However, our country as the country of origin of it, its import. As developing countries, Mexico and the Philippines share several challenges, but, but also aspirations, such as combating climate change, reducing the effects of and vulnerability to natural disaster, providing protection and assistance to our migrants, fighting poverty and promoting sustainable tourism, among, uh, among others, convinced that this challenges due to their transnational nature re require international cooperation. The current, uh, <clears throat> the current complex context imposes challenges, but also opportunities to strengthen bilateral relations. Despite the friendly and cooperative partnership that our countries have formed over almost 500 years, we are still a long way for harnessing the potential for cooperation that our affinities and shared history offer us. In this sense, I think it is time to look back and appreciate how much it has brought our people together and use this memory as a as platform to strengthen our relationship. I hope that this short talk will allow you to know a little more about my country and our bilateral relationship based on trust and friendship is mutual knowledge and understanding. Before finish my presentation, I would like to express that there are reasons for be, to be optimistic about the future of the relation between our two countries. An example of this are the, the communities of Mexipinos in, in the United States. <laughs> allowed to explain myself. The historical ties shared between Mexico and the Philippines, including culture, traditions, music, religion, food, and, in, and to some extent language, have allowed the creation of communities of Philippines, of Mexipinos in the United States, particularly on the Pacific coast. Filipinos and Mexicans, who immigrated to North America, mainly to the state of California, have found in their com communalities the basis to unite destinations and family, families outside their countries of origin, convinced that together they can move towards to a better common destiny. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Marami salamat. Uh, Senor Embajador. Um, thank you now to all our speakers for their enlightening presentation. We will now open the floor to questions and comments from our audience. Zoom attendees may use the chat or the question and answer function to send their questions. For our audience on Facebook, you may post your questions in the comments section and the technical team will collate, collate and forward them to our speakers. Thank you. Um, okay, there's a question now. Um, is there a com commonality of the South American countries and the Philippines when it comes to macroeconomics? What are the products that are most commonly traded between the country and the continent? Any, um, this can be answered by any ambassador or any diplomat. Uh, may, may I? Um, professor? Uh, Thank you, thank you for the thank you thank you for the question. I think that it's uh, it's important that all of us, all the ambassadors present here, all the missions present here, we realize as uh, we emphasize that there is a lot of complementarity 
in the sense that uh, there uh, a vast uh, space for growth in uh, international trade between the Philippines and the countries of Latin America. Uh, on the specific, of course, we do have a, a uniqueness in our array of products that we do each country and also uh, what we export as a, uh, our export offers for different basket of products. But in terms of macroeconomics, what is very significant is that all the countries uh, in the region and is, is market economies. So we work on the basis of markets and how markets work with different emphasis though in terms of a social public policy regarding to uh, uh, the development or to the scheme to promote uh, uh, economics, macroeconomics. But basically, Chile is, and I know that all the other countries that we are represented tonight here, we are uh, market economists with uh, different emphasis in terms of the instrument of that. So in macroeconomic terms, for instance, in Chile, uh, fiscal policy is very important uh, and to have a, a good source of balance in debt uh, in, and, uh, in terms that we want to um, not depend of one particular market, but we'd rather try to make a wider approach and to share uh, our export-oriented uh, products or our export offer in different uh, market of destiny. And uh, basically we are rule-based, that is very important in terms of international trade. We are very strong supported of the WTO, uh, in the case of Chile and Mexico, and we are uh, EPEC economies, and therefore since uh, many years, since in early 90s, Mexico before Chile, uh, Chile came and became a member of EPEC in 1994, Mexico was before than, than Chile. We have been working together with the community of countries in the Asia Pacific region in promoting rule based economy and in terms of promoting international trade, trade facilitation and investment, and economic cooperation. So, all those uh, elements are centered to define. Uh, the possibility of a uh, move forward in a joint platforms of public policy and macroeconomics. Thank you. Uh, let's, um, would anybody else among the ambassadors want to comment on that or add to that? Okay, let's go to the next question. To His Excellency Ambassador Antonio Jose Maria de Sousa, uh, what are the three important legacies of Fernando Magallanes um, um, in coming to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil? In what aspects of Brazilian life would such legacy be present? Thank you, much, muchísimas gracias. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Lamberto, for uh, this very interesting question. Uh, let me first, very briefly, as this is my first intervention, salute very specially uh, His Excellencies, Ambassador Gerardo Lozano, Ambassador Claudio Alberto Rojas, and the Chargé d'Affaires Argentine, my dear friend Mauricio, and of course, our uh, uh, distinguished moderator, Professor Joshita. I'm, I'm, I feel very fortunate to be being able to uh, make a contribution also to this um, panel. Uh, of course, second in the pre-recorded video that Ambassador Sosa Silva sent uh, for us today. Uh, regarding the question of Mr. Lamberto, um, I, I would say this is not a very easy question because it's difficult to talk about a legacy of a, a stay of only 13 days of the fleet in Rio de Janeiro. So I cannot say that there, there is a mark of this passage, other than the reports we've received uh, through time. Uh, but anyway, I'll make an effort to, to raise some, some ideas uh, in order to, um, to address this, this, this interesting question. 
maybe uh, one, one of the legacies could be the, the effect that the arrival of the Portuguese in the Brazilian coast would have had in the cosmology of the indigenous peoples uh, receiving for the first time the, the, the vision and the experience of, of, of experiencing uh, the, the, in the exchanges they experienced with the Portuguese and, and, and Spanish and, and Italians and, and the members of, of the fleet in Brazil. And uh, as we know uh, today through the reports of Antonio Pigafetta and others, this was a period of, of love and peace, uh, feast in love making is the term <laughs> some historians use, uh, which is very interesting because I, I think it makes today part of also the cosmology that the international uh, community started having about Brazil. Uh, of course, when, when they arrived in Brazil, which I'm calling Brazil, but of course it was a coastline uh, part of, 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 of the Portuguese crown for only 19 years, uh, um, it, it, everything was very new. And, and, and of course, uh, these experiences are, are something that... Uh, uh, only known and, and now we can imagine only through reports. Um, so, but anyway, this is a mark in history, and this is important as as it is because it was the first stop of a very difficult journey um, of circumnavigation, and it was in the Brazilian coast in a place that would later be known as one of the most beautiful places of Brazil the Guanabara Bay, which is a part of now Brazilian's second most large city. Um, we cannot say that was a complete coincidence because uh, one of the sailors, the Portuguese sailors, suggested that the uh, fleet would stop in Brazil because he had been there before and had a child there. Uh, and, and so uh, th this would be my reflections on this in qu uh, question of Mr. Lamberto. And it, it brings me to, to, to also say that it, it, it makes me celebrate the one mark of Brazilian identity, which is the multiculturalism. And I know that Professor Jaushita uh, is an expert about this mestizo culture and the value of, 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 of this characteristic of the Filipino people, the Latin American people. So I'm, I'm very proud to say that the multiculturalism is a characteristic that the Brazilians share with the Filipino people. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay, there's another question here. Um, this, this can be answered by any of the ambassadors from the Spanish American countries. The Argentina, Chile, Mexico, and Peru have foreign policy, policy plans to promote closer ties with Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines. For instance, like promoting the teaching of Spanish in the Philippines or encouraging um, these countries to participate in ASEAN. Thank you. Anybody from the Spanish American countries would like to answer this? Okay, may I? Sure, please. Okay, I, it is it is a very interesting question because uh, although that the Spanish was a language that uh, was practiced for a long period of time here in the Philippines, I consider that uh, just a very few percentage of the population speaks Spanish. And uh, there is a great uh, interest, and I consider that the Spanish is a very interesting tool for promoting more stronger relations between Mexico, uh, with, between Philippines and Latin American countries. There are several efforts to approach universities in order to uh, reinforce the teaching of the Spanish as a additional language in the uh, Filipino uh, universities. But uh, I consider that we need to continue working hardest in order to, to, to achieve a better uh, success. And uh, just going back to the one of the, 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 the previous questions uh, on which uh, products uh, we trade more 
between Latin America and the uh, uh, Philippines, I want to say that at least in the case of Mexico, the trade is concentrated mainly in one sector, is in the, uh, uh, the technological and automotive industry, where Mexico and Philippines, uh, we exchange parts and components for this uh, industry. But the, the, there are a very big interest in both sides to increase the, the trade, including in other sectors. And the one sector with a very big potential is the uh, food industry, where uh, the communities uh, uh, provide areas of, of opportunities for increasing the trade between both regions. This is my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Here's a comment. Um, I've learned new and interesting information, particularly about Ramon Fabie, a Filipino hero in Mexico. It really boggles the mind to know that the interaction between, between the East and the West during those times is the result of the circumnavigation of the world. Thank you. It's a comment. It's not a question. Okay. Or would let Mex Mex Mexican ambassador, would you like to comment on that? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, since my arrival here to the Philippines, I started studying the, the relations between Mexico and the Philippines. And uh, I found that, that uh, during the independence period, uh, several Filipinos participated in the independence war of Mexico. But one of the most uh, famous uh, Filipinos heroes in the independence is this young uh, Ramon Fabier. Ramon Fabia, he participated in the independent movement of Mexico with a, a group of young students of mining in Mexico who uh, were embodied of these uh, uh, libertarian ideas and, and, and participated in this, in this uh, process. They made a very important contribution at the beginning of the Mexican independence uh, process. But unfortunately, at the few months, not just him, this group of young students uh, were captured by the royalist force and executed. But uh, nevertheless, in some Mexican universities and uh, in the history of Mexico, the name of Ramon Fabier is very well known. Uh, we are trying also to um, uh, to uh, that that Ramon Fabier be recognized. There are some research uh, trying to found the presence of, of Ramon. Ramon Fabier, because we consider that the legacy of Ramon Fabier, the uh, commonality is between uh, both countries, Mexico and the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, too. If I may say something about the Fabier. Fabier is actually a, a, a family name that's found also in the Philippines until today, but it's not a very common family name, so they might be related to Ramon Fabier. In fact, one of our neighbors here in my subdivision is a Fabier. It's an old family. Okay, there are other questions here. Um, oh, this is, ad uh, okay. This is addressed to Mauricio Herman Munoz. How do you assess the diplomatic relationship between the Philippines and Argentina? In what aspects? Do the Philippines and Argentina share commonalities? How, what, what do they share in terms of history and culture? Thank you very much for the question. Well, first of all, uh, to assess uh, the bilateral relations. Well, Argentina and the Philippines have historically enjoyed friendly relations, which has translated into the wide array of agreements that have been signed between our countries in different fields, such as culture, sports, technical cooperation, and more recently between diplomatic academies. This was uh, actually signed uh, not long ago in May when we convened the fourth meeting of the bilateral consultations mechanism between our countries. Um, in regard to the, um, the, the shared aspects when it comes to culture and history, 
Um, I would like to say, I think their excellencies have mentioned the upcoming panel in November. I would also like to, to, to mention that we are having an Argentinian academic. Uh, his name is Professor Ezequiel Ramoneda. He will be presenting the historical links between our countries uh, before the establishment of bilateral relations. I think he will be covering the 16th, no, 17th and 18th century. So um, I highly recommend uh, for uh, to anyone interested in, in this topic to, to, to join that webinar. Uh, having said that, there are many uh, coincidences as some uh, other ambassadors have mentioned, uh, the Spanish language and religion. Actually, nowadays there are many priests and nuns from Argentina working here in the Philippines. So this has been a, a continuous thing actually for uh, since the establishment of bilateral relations and even before that. So I think that's one of the, the, the most outstanding aspects when it comes not to state actors, but to people to people links. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see, there are few, there's another question here. Um, to His Excellency Ambassador Gerardo Lozano Arredondo, what are three uh, areas where the Philippines and Mexico um, could work together to strengthen their bilateral diplomatic relations? Muchas gracias. So what are three areas where the Philippines and Mexico can work together to strengthen their diplomatic relations? I want to say... Relations? Okay, thank you. Thanks for the for the the question. Although that Mexico and the Philippines, we have a very strong and friendly relations. There are some areas of opportunities, and uh, in my opinion, one of the most important is in the area of of, of trade. I think that the uh, there is a very uh, important, uh, it's a very important area of opportunity because as I said, the, the trade between our countries is very well, it's very concentrated in a few products and we can to expand the trade relations. In the point of view of Mexico, also Philippines can be the, the, the door from uh, Southeast countries and also uh, Mexico can be the, the door for Filipino products in Latin America because we have several uh, free trade agreements. Another area of, of uh, opportunity to strengthen the, the bilateral relations is in the area of migration. Mexico and Philippines, we share um, the reality that we have so many workers outside of the country and uh, both countries has some positive experience in promoting better links between the country and the uh, diaspora. But also Philippines is a country that has a very good experience protecting the, uh, their workers. And uh, one uh, other area where we can reinforce the bilateral and diplomatic relations is in the area of natural disasters. Unfortunately, uh, Mexico and Philippines, we share the, um, the situation that uh, both countries receive several um, hurricanes or typhoon that uh, create uh, important damage from, from the from the community and we have some uh, very good practice and uh, policies that we can share and they can be can benefit both sides uh, Mexico and the Philippines those are the areas where I consider that, that we can continue strengthening the collaboration thank you very much now here's a question that that is addressed to everybody here um, good day. Uh, very interesting exchange about diplomacy and international relations. May we know more about the appreciation of colonialism or the reception of colonialism and early globalization during the 16th century? That's one question raised. And then there's a follow-up question. How did this uh, reception of colonialism and early uh, globalization change today? in the more contemporary cultural landscape. Anybody would like to answer that question? First question is maybe know more about the, how colonialism was received during the 16th century. 
the next question is about um, how um, globalization is regarded today, I suppose, in Latin America. Yes, uh, from the Chilean ambassador. Thank you. Uh, it's a challenging question and it's a complex question because yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's underlying a, a sort of a criticism of the meaning and the perception of the extension of colonialization that took place in different momentum in history and different momentum of mankind. Uh, it's difficult to compare to because the set of rules that they were then in the 16th centuries are not the one that we have nowadays. So there is no uh, a sort of equivalent in terms of comparison in the sense of imperialism or colonialism and globalization and imperialism or colonization. Uh, from my own perspective, and I think that is a, uh, the position of my government, is the sense that uh, the process of colonization done by Spain was the result of what events that took place during those uh, centuries. Now, when we start to be an independent country, and this is very significant, in 1810, the first junta that put together in Chile, it was because of the fact that the king of Spain was retained by Napoleon. So therefore, in order to retain the sense of governorship of the colonies, uh, the first junta was formed, and then there was a sort of a organization and, and sort of self-governance in the sense because the king was in, in, in prison. He was subject to be imprisoned by the French. And so therefore, uh, in, in that very icon moment in the Chilean history to become an independent country, at the very beginning was the sense of uh, protection. Meanwhile, the king was hired or was retained by uh, France. But right after that, two years, two, two years after, sorry, that sense of independence is growth in the sense that we will do uh, our own independence movement and we self-governing and then start a process of independence that went through all Latin American countries for several years until in the case of Chile of 1818 and become a fully independent country. But what it was important though, that in terms of the framework, how the country was organized uh, during the colonial time and then when the start independence, it follows so the pattern that was ruling uh, before with the Spaniards. So the church was very significant, then the, we have a system of encomiendas where land was allocated to certain people that was retained, so on and so forth. So in that sense, uh, the sense of colonialism was no a sense of the sense of criticism or colonialism vis-a-vis -vis what it happens in the 60s with uh, colonialism in Africa and the movement of this colonization and what it did by the, the committee of, in the United Nations of this colonization. Uh, so it's, it's a tricky question in that sense because now if you see from the nowadays dynamics in terms of globalization and then it equal the globalization process as sort of colonialism. Well, right there in, in, in the Chilean case, our foreign policy is sustained in the fact that we're a very small country, but we work with international institution, United Nations system, World Trade Organization, APEC, and namely, and we create a framework of a series of free trades and binding treaties and the respect of rule and law 
and the solution and of, uh, by pacific means of disputes and resolutions is meaning that we want to manage in a proper manner those challenges that could be imposed by globalization but knowing the same footing that globalization is equal to colonialism. Why so? Because I go a little bit further. Because at the end, globalization is part of a process of itself. It's Chile has gains in the process of open up markets and economic integration and international cooperation. Therefore, uh, globalization present challenge and it goes without saying they are losers and they are winners in the globalization process and they are global public bads and global public goods related to globalization but in that setting is for countries the challenge to try to make a more balanced approach in the process of globalization so no one will really take advantage in favor of itself and creating disadvantage for others. So that's why it's so important to try to have a rule-based international system and a norm setting, international system that is well respected. So I don't see the equivalent. I do see the, the perception, and I would love to have a conversation with the person that pose this question because it's a very interesting one and there is no a commonality in the sense of approach how to deal with it. There's different school of thoughts that they deal in one way or another but in the sense that uh, I don't see necessarily an equivalent between colonis colonialism and globalization. Thank you very much Ambassador. Uh, here's a question. How is Dia de la Hispanida viewed in Latin America? Is it celebrated? That's from one of our PACLAS members, Ferdinand Llanes of UP. May, may I go, go first? Because I think in the case of Brazil, it's the easiest answer possible, because we don't. That, uh, um, of course, uh, I, I served in Spain before coming here, and uh, it, it has different names. Uh, it could be Dia de la Raza and Dia de la Hispanidad. And of course, this does not include Brazil. Uh, we we do, though, uh, celebrate the arrival of uh, Col Columbus uh, in the Americas, uh, but this, this, this is not celebrated, as I, I imagine, in other Hispanic um, countries. Um, so this is not the case of Brazil. Uh, well, I can speak for Argentina. We do not celebrate Dia de la Hispanidad. As Ricardo was saying, uh, well, we used to celebrate Dia de la Raza, but uh, this has changed. Nowadays, it's a national holiday, October 12, but uh, we call it the Day of Respect for Cultural Diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Any other comments? Also, yes, also in the case of Mexico, we don't celebrate the uh, Dia de la Hispanidad. I, I consider that that is a more uh, American celebration, that in fact is very popular in the United States. But in the case of Mexico, we celebrate the Dia de la Raza, but also the day of the encounter of two worlds, not the discovery of America. The, the way that we celebrate is the, the encounter of two worlds and the beginning of the birth of a Mexico as a nation. Thank you. So interesting. Um, any other comment from, uh, from Chile, yes. perhaps? In the case of Chile, uh, this, uh, this is very interesting and it's, a, it's also a complex question. Uh, is been evolved. We have to acknowledge that we used to celebrate El Dia de la Hispanidad or El Dia de la Raza. Now this has evolved. We don't celebrate in any sense uh, that in terms of uh, 
like Dia de Hispanidad, and we don't celebrate the Dia de la Raza, but we celebrate the encounter of two worlds too, the moment that two worlds they were bringing together. So that's, that's very unique. And probably you have seen a very fascinating international debate uh, that is uh, led by the president of Mexico in the sense of the recent celebrations in Mexico. And it's a, it's a very, and this is my perception, it's a very fascinating way to, to put forward uh, the sense of uh, the meaning also in a different perspective of what it was um, 200 years ago or so. Thank you very much. If I may intervene, um, I'm fascinated by how the meaning of the Dia de la Hispanidad has evolved. Um, actually, I regard the day with affection because I owe to it a free tour of uh, the Holy Land in my youth. Um, I was traveling around um, um, the Holy Land as a young man, and I was at the, at the Church of the uh, Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. When I heard this uh, this um, couple speaking with a, with a Spanish friar in Spanish, so I introduced myself and I found out I was Filipino. He invited me to join them for uh, breakfast the, the following day. It was October 12th, the Dia de la Hispanida. And there I met, there I met uh, a Puerto Rican and uh, an Argentine couple who were driving around the Holy Land. So they invited me and the Puerto Rican and another Argentine to join them in their trip around the Holy Land. So I got a trip around the Holy Land for free in their car. Thanks to the Dia de la Hispanidad. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different perspective I have, but you know, things change. We realize, we realize now that of course uh, there is, there's a dark side to this. Thank you. Uh, uh, Butch, Dr. Josita, uh, can I uh, add sure, something? Sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, I was the one who asked the question. <laughs> we are, uh, the team in, in charge of or part of this panel of Philippine Academic Consortium for Latin American Studies. No? That's very interesting. I, I, I haven't heard of that, the Dia de la Raza. No? That's, uh, that's, that's really new to me. Because when I was in Spain, when I left Spain, I left uh, on the day of Hispanidad, Dia de Hispanidad. And I was uh, quite, uh, you know, wondering, wow, is this something that I should celebrate? And I met uh, Mexican scholars, Argentine scholars in the Archivo de General de Indias. And, you know, it was, it was natural for us to come together. You know, uh, you know I, this Argentinian woman, a researcher, came to me and we spoke to each other, another Mexican. And the sentiments are common. They, they don't like Spain. <laughs> And it was, you know, it's something that, uh, that uh, uh, it's really a food for thought. No? And just being, uh, uh, it's quite a, a sentiment no? on the ground. No? And so that's why I, I had to ask. No? Thank you for your answers. Thank you, too. Thank you. It seems there are no more questions. Uh, is it okay? Here's another uh, one. One question: Is it fair to say that bilateral relations between the Philippines and Latin American countries are truly mutually beneficial in the present times? That that is that can be answered by any member of the panel. Is it fair to say that bilateral relations between the Philippines and Latin American countries today are mutually beneficial? Uh, I will take the, the pattern. It goes without saying yes. And I will repeat three times yes. It's of mutual benefit. It goes without saying. What is the reality, though, is that uh, it's a fact. It's uh, the reality that we are far away, that we have a very, we have not yet reached a level of common understanding and knowledge base in both parts of, uh, of the equation. So we're still so much very pending 
on that. But it goes a yes that there is a lot of potential and mutual benefit for us, for the two sides of the of the coin. Uh, and we have to make also a realization to that is a reality. Uh, countries like Chile or Mexico, we have been intertwined with colleagues in EPEC and, and in Southeast Asia, much more closer in terms of cooperation, economic integration, public policy, best practices, benchmarking, all of that. And it's very positive. But that takes place in, 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 the, in the framework of APEC. So sometimes the reality, the Czech reality, is that in the framework of APEC, there is a, a profound exchange. But meanwhile, bilaterally and country to country, it could be a challenge, and it could be uh, more diverse, or maybe it, could, it doesn't present the same level of work together that we have in this setting. And that's probably so, because we have to see a reality. We are small countries, I'm, I'm talking about Chile, and the Philippines, we have limited resources, limited, I mean, the Philippines is a big country, it's 100, 100 million plus, Chile is only 17 million, but there's also priorities. And that's probably all right to do priorities. I mean, countries have to focus in terms of sources and have to focus in function of results and, of course, of matters of common interest. And then in Latin America and in the Southern Cone, the Philippines and the presence of the Philippines in South America, for instance, is in Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. And from those three postings, they cover the rest of the region. Where you have other countries in Latin America, I'm talking about the Southern Cone, that they are very significant and very important too. But they are covered, you know, in terms of concurrency from different postings of the Philippines. For instance, the trade officer for the Philippines, for responsible for the Americas, is based in Washington, D.C. So, uh, and he has a very, a very large area to cover, you see? So therefore, uh, there is a, there's possibility, there's potential, uh, there's opportunities, it's a yes, yes, a model benefit, but of course, you need also resources and you need a human capacity to promote that and to create an able environment. I mean, there's no way that an, an environment is going to be all of the same pop up, have to be created. So that's probably the challenge when I am referring previously that we have several opportunities at hand, but along with those several opportunities, there are challenges. There's no doubt, you know? And I'm saying this from the perspective that we've been here since 1967. Yes. If, if I may add something to that, I think one problem that we're facing in the Philippines is not as, ex it's not as export oriented towards Latin America as our neighbors are like Japan, South Korea, China, or even some of our Southeast Asian neighbors. That is a big problem. Um, our our mar market is still largely the United States and Japan. Okay, um, here's a question um, from Pia in Bulacan. What are the factors why the Spanish language didn't dominate in the Philippines, unlike in our friends in Latin America? Anybody would like to answer that question? So there's this question about why the Spanish language didn't dominate in the Philippines, unlike in our friends in Latin America. Anybody would like to? Well, I, I could make some comments. Uh, yes, please. Even though I think uh, Filipino could uh, help us more than uh, than um, we 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 making some speculation uh, because of the very characteristic history of the Philippines having. Uh, being occupied by several 
powers after the three hundreds of, of convents, as you say, and and fifties, uh, one hundred years of Hollywood. I think the the presence of the United States after uh, the the war, Spanish American War, was was very strong in that sense. Even though the elites of the time used to speak Spanish, as was the case of Rizal. Then, uh, with the time swept away, um, this 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 powerful element of of identity. But uh, well, speaking uh, from my standpoint, uh, even though the question is very specific about Spanish, I, I can say that the Portuguese is a very strong mark of the Brazilian identity, and it, it is something that uh, amazes uh, some historians on on how such a big country. Uh, could keep united as a territory in the first place and uh, speaking the same language, uh, even though Brazil was, of course, occupied by many, many different tribes. And we still today have uh, many uh, communities speaking their native languages. But uh, we, we we can say today, based on, on sociological and historical studies, that uh, two very big forces kept Brazil uh, under this umbrella of, of of shared identity, one of these was was the power of of the crown. Brazil, as the black swan of Latin America, had a very interesting independence that was declared by the son of the Portuguese king, which became the the emperor of Brazil. And in the times of the Napoleon invasion in Europe, the headquarters of the European Empire. Uh, the, the Portuguese Empire was Brazil, was in Rio de Janeiro, uh, which is very impressive. And then when uh, when the crown prince uh, declared independence of Brazil, the, the the very concept of the crown and and with this the speaking the Portuguese speaking force of the Portuguese crown is considered uh, an element of. Uh, uh, keeping uh, Brazil together as as a nation in the centuries to come. Just a just a, a comment to to address the question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, allow me to comment on that. I'm 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 not a historian. I'm an anthropologist by training, but I'm very interested, of course, in the history of the Spanish language in this country um, because um, it has to. It, that has influenced our sense of identity of who we are. Uh, I just want to comment that actually uh, it is wrong to imagine that the Spanish language was a cornerstone of Spanish colonial rule in the Americas. Uh, it was really Catholicism on the one hand and the inter intermarriages. Um, I was told by my Mexican historians that actually when Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1820, uh, Spanish itself is still not widely spoken, even in Mexico City itself. Uh, what really popularized Mex uh, Spanish in Mexico were, was, was, was really the um, Mexican mestizos, who saw it as a vehicle for uniting the country because of the, some, the diverse diversity of languages. So um, in the same way, actually, uh, it is wrong to imagine that uh, that's, uh, Spanish language was the original cornerstone of unity in the Philippines. Originally, it was Catholicism and the mixing of races. Now, um, in Spain itself, um, public education started only during the second half of the 19th century, as in the rest of Europe. And the Philippines was actually quite advanced because public education in the Philippines started in 1863, contrary to American propaganda. Now, slowly Spanish spread. Uh, Spanish indeed became the language not only of the elite, but the wide sections of the population, uh, there was even a Spanish, there were even several Spanish patois that developed, both in Manila itself and in the provinces. But it was not to the it was not to the advantage of Americans to see another language here. So they very slowly um, they press, they press, press, uh, pressured the schools to remove Spanish as the language very slowly. So eventually Ateneo and Santo Tomas gave up using um, Spanish as the vehicle of instruction. And then, of course, businesses used Eng English, um, but for, for a long time, the uh, law courts and the uh, congressmen of the Philippines were using Spanish in their debates, but 
eventually by the 1940s, it was on the way to extinction, 1950s, to be more precise, 1950s, especially after World War II. So it's a complex issue that has to be uh, faced. Um, one last, oh, another question. What is the shared collective vision for the next 500 years for Latin America? <laughs> in terms of conviviality and solidarity, what is the shared collective vision for the next 500 years for Latin America? That's a big question. Uh, professor, uh, I, I would like to elaborate a bit in, in the other comments uh, that you mentioned about uh, the language, the Spanish language. I was explaining, I like history, I'm not an historian, but I like history. And I was explained by someone that what it happens here in the Philippines, and maybe you can comment on that, is that the, the priests that came with the Spaniards move into inland and they start to promote faith, but in order to do so, they learn the local language. Yes. Meanwhile, in Latin America, the priests, they move inland, but because of the mestizaje and all that, they didn't spoke uh, in terms of faith with the local uh, community, so to say, language, the local uh, community. They spoke Spanish. So there was the differences. The degree of mestizaje that it came from a Spanish uh, colonialism into our shores, it was very intertwined. So Correct. from my, and let me give you an example. From my father's side, his, fam his two family names, Rojas and Corvalan, he comes from a very middle center city of uh, Chile in the south, south central that is called Talca. And the two family names have been there for 200, 300 years before. Meanwhile, in the case of my mother, she is first generation of a German Jewish, German Jewish that came to Latin America in 1918, I'm married to a Chilean woman, and there comes my mother. You see? So the fact of migration, the fact that uh, in one way or another, um, the promotion of Catholicism use local language here in the Philippines rather than the Spanish as an instrument to, to Christianize the people is different. Now, on the second perception, and maybe maybe what I have heard and what I have read here about the Spanish in the Philippines is 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 being proved what the comment that you made. Now, on the second question or the last question that they said about a common vision for 500 years or more to come in Latin America is like a, no one is magic to have a, <laughs> a, a crystal ball. No, it's a, I think that. You have had different sequence of movement, of political movements in, in, in Latin America since the year 2000, so to say. Let's say, let's make a deal. Let's say 2000, or even let's say about the 1960s. In the 1960s, we were very much engaged with Aladi, that it was the uh, Latin America and where my colleague and my good friend Gerardo was posted. It was an organization to promote trade integration in the Americas, you know, and we're still working there. <laughs> we will be working for many years there. <laughs> and then we have the concept of uh, the years of 2000 and the great, uh, what it was initiated by President Lula of Brazil with UNASUR. And then we have the uh, the OES, you no, know, the American State, Organization of American State, and, and all the integration of all the Americas and the Caribbeans. And there are so many diverse, and we have just recently and some years ago, create CELAC, you know, that is another organization similar to the OES, the Organization of American State, 
but with the exception of not having in the discussion United States and Canada. And what is interesting, because you see here in ASEAN, you have a scheme where you talk to each other in the ASEAN context, and then you enjoy with others, with other partners, you know, and so you have the ASEAN, ASEAN plus United States, ASEAN plus China, ASEAN plus Japan, but you discuss among the ASEAN community first. And then the big kids in town enjoy the discussion with you guys. In our case, in Latin America, it's more complex. And if you realize also, and this is my, I'm not talking about the flag that I have behind, I'm talking my own perception. If you realize that in the sense of what it really happens in Latin America, that in a very small portion of land, we have an explosion of different countries independent, that, that's in Central America. Vis-a-vis -vis what just was referenced by Ricardo, that in the case of Brazil, it was unique in a sense that it was contained in just one single geographical unit, a country that was very diverse and it had different level of development among the regions when it became a nation to be independent, but they decide to be uh, an, an empire. I mean, in, in Brazil there was a monarchy, you see? And that monarchy lasts for many years, very close towards to the end of the 18th centuries. You see, so that's the difference. So I don't see that we have a, a crystal ball in common. We have a desire that we should have a common, uh, so to say, uh, dream to bring up to bring about good for all the countries of the Latin American countries of all the countries in our region and probably we have to work on those challenges posed by the diversity itself that all the countries we face with and with this I finish uh, we create some time ago a, a, a public policy that supports our foreign policy in Latin America and in the world, but particularly in Latin America, is uh, integration with diversity. So we, we account the fact that we are diverse, but we promote the fact to integrate. So we do have commonalities that will help us to be integrated, but also we realize that we are diverse too. So integration more diverse, that's, that's a reality. Thank you very much. I think there are no more questions. So perhaps it's time to provide a short summary and synthesis of the presentations in relation to the panel and the um, Queen Centennial commemorations in the Philippines. Uh, to summarize, I, I, not, I realized there are these three points that came across. First was to discuss the, the impact of the voyage of Magellan as it passed um, down the Atlantic, touching the Brazilian coast, Argentina, and Chile, and as it rounded uh, the um, Tierra del Fuego to go out into the Pacific. So the um, um, one, one interesting information that came across was that there was actually a young um, Carioca who joined the vessel, one of the vessels of Magellan. So there was a Brazilian component in the expedition that touched base in the Philippines. Another um, important point was that um, um, when you talk about Argentina, you must also talk about the Malvinas. And definitely the Malvinas is, the, the history of the Malvinas is tied up with the expedition of Magellan. Um, another, a second point that was raised was that um, there's been a commonality of uh, culture between the Philippines and Latin America as a result of this uh, expedition. Um, an important commonality is Catholicism, but um, Mexican ambassador also brought in other commonalities, for example, in in the realm of sports like cockfighting, in, the, um, in food, in uh, architecture like the Palapa, and costume like the uh, Baran Tagalog and the Guevara. Um, a third uh, theme that surfaced was the need to to build the present and the future on the basis of commonalities. Um, there are commonalities that bind us together. So um, 
on the basis of this, what partnership can we forge? Um, one very interesting partnership that was uh, mentioned by the Mexican ambassador was the fact that, in fact, the, the uh, partnerships are so intimate in um, in part of the United States because of the fact that there's a lot of intermarriage between Filipinos and Mexicans. In fact, you have the phenomenon of Mexipinos, Mexican Filipinos. That's one. But um, uh, in other areas, for example, like trade, um, th there is much to be done because there is um, there is trade between the Philippines and Mexico, but it is limited to certain areas only. And the Philippines has to build. And the Philippines and Latin America, specifically Brazil, Chile, Argentina, really have to broaden their their trading um, trading activities with each other. So more or less, those are the three themes that uh, that I found very uh, cogent. One is the impact, the actual impact of the voyage of Magellan. Um, secondly, the exchange of culture, um, the exchange of commonalities across the Pacific. And third, um, building a, a present and a future together as partners. With that, we end the last panel of the inaugural session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. It is now 8.10 Philippine Standard Time. We invite everyone to catch the second session of the um, EIQC entitled Ilustrado Histo Historiography and Confined by the Philippine Historical Association and the Tene de Manila History Department. The first panel of that session will be on the 25th of October at 9 a.m. You can catch the live stream on the Facebook pages flashed on your screen or join us here in the Zoom for first come first served basis by registering at www.nqc.gov dot ph slash pigc this has been your moderator fernando shelsita from ateneo de manila university thank you and have a good day <laughs>